everybody uh, and welcome to this session of our virtual summer school uh, which has started today. Um, my name is Claire and I'm from the CPD unit. I'd like to take uh, this uh, opportunity to just say thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we hope you find the session really interesting. A um, couple of really quick housekeeping things. Um, please use the chat function if you have any um, technical issues and the Q&A if you have questions for Rowan who is our speaker today. We'll keep an eye on questions and answer those at the end for you. Um, so that is enough from me. I am delighted to welcome your presenter for this session, who is Rowan Dent, Senior Creator, Creative at Equinox PR and Comms. Hi, Rowan. Hi there. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Um, I'm hoping that is working. That's uh, working now, Rowan, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, hello, yeah, I am um, Rowan Dent, Senior Creative at Equinox PR and Comms Agency. Um, I'm going to be delivering the webinar today and I've got eight years of experience across um, lots of different sectors, including charity, PR, advertising, social media. Um, I've kind of done a little bit of everything, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to answer any questions that you might have um, and feel free to ask those at any time, um, but we'll probably get to them at the end when we've got a Q&A and a discussion. Okay, so to kick off, um, I'm, I know we've got a big range of experiences, uh, kind of experience levels at this webinar, but um, I'm hoping that by the end of the hour, you will um, have learned a little bit about how to spot good and bad copy. Um, you might have gained some confidence in your day-to-day -day copywriting. Um, and discover some tips to kind of save you 
um, time and stress, particularly if you're under pressure or writing something that you don't normally write. Um, and also sort of tips about crafting some error-free copies. So those all important editing and proofwriting, proofreading skills. So um, first of all, uh, what is copywriting? Um, there's lots of different definitions for this. Um, you know, some kind of including writing marketing materials, which only covers one aspect um, of copywriting to that kind of poetic salesmanship angle, which overlooks kind of how you are doing it. Um, so I would say that copywriting is the craft of writing persuasive messages that prompt people to take action. Um, so that might be buying something, it might be donating to a cause or inquiring about a service. Um, you're writing something to persuade, I would say. Um, and within copywriting, there's, there's lots of different kinds of copywriting. So um, your creative copywriting is, you know, you may have a very long time to come up with a concept for an ad. Um, you know, maybe just a few words or a kind of um, uh, some kind of hook to the commercial. Um, sales copywriting is something that we're kind of most familiar with, I would say. Um, you know, and that includes things like product copy on websites. Um, because even, you know, even the words that you use um, to describe something will persuade people and will change kind of people's perceptions um, through to web content, which is kind of anything that is written for web or, um, you know, maybe read on a, on a mobile or tablet device. And um, so for that, you've got a very short period of time to grab people's attention. Um, PR copywriting is things like press releases and statements. And then SEO copywriting is kind of a very specific area, which is um, all about using um, search kind of engine, uh, things like, like Google Analytics to find out what words your audience is using to search for things um, and then taking those words, putting them into your copy to kind of bump up your, um, your results on a uh, search engine. So um, why does good copy matter then? Um, I think it matters because um, you've always got choice. Um, you know, if you're looking to buy something um, or, you know, to uh, attend a university, you will be looking at more than one option. So if there is one option where people are using obvious spelling or grammar mistakes or their copy is confusing or boring, you're more likely to go with the one that, um, that kind of excites you um, and, and seems more professional. Um, on average, visitors only read 20% of the content on a web page. So yeah, as I've said, like you have such a short amount of time to grab people's attention and using the right words can really help you to do that. Um, I find this one kind of interesting uh, that just adding the word because and a reason um, in increases engagement from 60% to, to 94% in a, in a recent study. So it's just as simple as that. Sometimes adding a simple one you know, sentence um, might make people a lot more interested and a lot more uh, able to engage with what you're saying. Um, and also the average reading age in the UK is nine. Um, and uh, The Guardian has a reading age of 14. Oops, it's that one, oops, sorry. Um, Guardian has a reading age of 14 um, and Sun has a reading age of 8. So obviously it doesn't mean that people can't understand what you're saying, it just means that it might take them two or three times of reading a sentence to, to get it um, and you just don't have that, that time to kind of keep that engagement. So um, obviously things are a little bit different right now. Um, you know. Um, COVID-19 has changed the way that people are interacting um, online. Uh, timings are different. Things like, you know, without a commute, many of us are consuming content on different channels and at different times. It's not, um, it's not necessarily a bad time to be talking to your audience because video consumption is up. Uh, Facebook and Instagram are seeing a 40% increase of usage. Um, so it's just about trying to make sure that you're talking to people in the right way. Um, so people are anxious, they're feeling bored, they're feeling distracted. Um, so we kind of just need to be careful about um, 
our kind of tone of voice. So I've put together a couple of things to do and things not to do. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge how people might be feeling. So, you know, you can't assume that people are feeling a particular way, um, but it's important not to be tone deaf or to go for the hard sell. People may have lost their jobs or um, be furloughed and they may be struggling with ill health themselves. Um, so it just doesn't feel like the right time for a really hard sell at the moment. Um, another thing that I think you can do is to explain what you're doing to support your staff or your students or your volunteers um, and why. People want to know that companies are um, looking after their, you know, the people that, um, that work for them or that they work for. Um, so, you know, just a simple line about how you are, um, you know, you have topped up people's furlough or you have um, introduced, um, you know, PPE into all of the kind of um, aspects of your, of your catering business, for example. Those kind of details can make you seem like um, a more reputable and caring organisation. Equally, um, I think you can just give people some freebies, you know, it's, um, it's not the time to be insisting on business as usual. If you've got a sign up fee or if you've got, um, you know, paywalls on your content, um, it can just be a great opportunity to, um, to offer your audience something for free um, and, you know, to give them something that's useful. So, you know, maybe craft some how to content um, on something that your, your audience is particularly worried about or interested in at the moment. Um, and also kind of writing in that authentic, relatable tone. Um, some of the nicest kind of social media posts I've seen from companies actually talk about how they are dealing with, um, with the epidemic and, you know, maybe using some humour, kind of talking about um, the struggles of working from home while also trying to homeschool. Um, but I have seen a lot of cliches like unprecedented and trying times um, which I just don't think really help because everybody knows um, that this is a trying time um, and it doesn't sort of need to be kind of overstated um, in that way, I don't think. Okay, so um, moving on to our first topic then, um, research. So research can really make or break your copy. Um, this example from this, this McDonald's ad featured a boy and his mother talking about his deceased father and he was distressed because he didn't seem to have much in common with his dad. Um, but then in the ad he finds out um, that both he and his father loved McDonald's fillet of fish burgers. Um, and the ad attracted a lot of criticism that it was trivialising grief, that it was likely to cause distress to bereaved children, um, was sort of basically just distasteful. Um, and they issued a, an apology and they had to pull the ad. Um, but with some research, um, whether that's through kind of online analytics or through um, using, um, you know, case studies or, you know, just having, having thinking a bit more carefully about who your audience is, you know, they might not have had to do that. Equally, this ad from Bloomingdale department store seems to encourage drugging and sexual assaults. Um, it caused an absolute furore when it came out, and I can't imagine that it was put in front of anybody before it went out um, outside of this ad agency, uh, because they would have immediately said, that's not funny, um, that's not going to work for your audience. Um, and this Google ad um, is a, it's a little bit more subtle, but with a Google ad, you've got a very small amount of space um, to say why your uh, customer should choose you. And the only thing that they have said is that they are not serving prom or school dancing, which just feels a bit miserable. And it's also alienating um, a section of their customer base. So what can we be doing um, to research then? So I like to keep a swipe file, um, which is essentially just screen grabbing um, anything that I see which works for my target audiences. Um, and I think um, it's effective. So maybe it's something that makes me smile, something that makes me want to buy it, something that makes me, um, you know, kind of engage or want to read more. 
Um, so it's just a matter of kind of, of screen grabbing that and dropping it into a folder. I've got one on my desktop and one on my phone. Um, and I try to include things that I wouldn't necessarily be writing um, because if you, you kind of never know what you might need to produce, especially if you work in a small business as a jack of all communication trades, um, you may find that you suddenly have to write um, you know, a blog when you've never written one before um, and you don't know where to start. So a swipe file can be really good for that. Um, another really brilliant way of researching um, is to listen to your audience using the inbuilt analytic tools um, from social media um, and Google as well. Um, so it can just really help in terms of um, you find out the exact words that your audience is using to describe their wishes and fears. Um, and you can use Google Analytics to find which word they use to search as well. Um, but I think it can be useful not just to replicate those words, but to actually think about the emotions that underpin them um, and see what keeps coming up. Um, use that as a kind of base for how to talk to your audience. Um, and equally, you can ask for feedback. Um, you can email your audience, uh, your customer base, um, you know, blog responses and messages, uh, comments on, on social media and direct messages as well. All of these are great ways to find out more about uh, who you're trying to target. Um, and in terms of research, I tend to spend as much research, um, as much time doing research as I do on my first draft of copy, uh, simply because it gives you more to work with. It gives you more material um, and it gives you a great kind of starting point. Okay, so moving on, um, topic two is about layout. So some people might not think that this is really part of copywriting, um, but if you are writing something, uh, it could be the most brilliant copy, but if you haven't laid it out in a way that people want to read it, um, it's just not gonna work. So this example, this kind of product description, um, it's all in the same size, all the same font, uh, there's no bolding, um, the paragraphs are quite long, um, and it's difficult to know at a glance what the most important information is, um, which is what layout does. It tells you what do I need to read now, um, and what do I need to read if I'm really interested, what's the extra detail. Um, and then this example from this Bolden um, design uh, for a website, it's very difficult to read. It might be very clever, um, but the problem is that you can't read what it says. So it doesn't matter how clever it is. So um, it kind of seems like it might not be the most important thing, but actually if you are unable to read something, then if you know, your audience is not going to be interested, not going to read on. Another bugbear of mine is um, the run-on run sentence in a, uh, using bullet points. It's fine to use run-on sentences. Um, I, I also argue that it's fine to use bullet points as separate sentences because uh, it still makes them easier to read um, on the page. But if you're going to use a bullet point as a run-on sentence, then make sure that it actually makes sense. So pearls can be found in the sea at a jeweler's um, rather than pearls, pearls can be found the sea go to a jeweler's. Um, and once you notice this, you will see it everywhere that people don't actually use um, bullet points in the way that they're supposed to. So um, what should we be doing? So this kind of concept of eye appeal um, means that when you look at um, a page of, of copy that you really want to read it. So you want a, a font that is good enough, you know, kind of big enough to read, um, that it's clear enough. Uh, short paragraphs, I tend to try and um, layer paragraphs. So you might have a paragraph which is one line followed by a longer paragraph so that it just kind of draws the eye um, and makes people want to read it. You can use bolding, italicizing, and underlining, um, but use it for emphasis um, and consider readability if your audience includes older people or people um, with sight issues make sure that they can read it um, and that it's clear and you're not just um, using those things for the sake of it 
bulleted or numbered lists, obviously, again, um, you know, break up the page. Uh, so do indented paragraphs or quotes um, can be a great way of highlighting the most interesting part of a quote. Um, things like visual cues, um, sometimes they look a little bit crass, they can look a little bit um, kind of clip arty, but they work very well. Um, and if you've got an arrow pointing um, to a form button or a sign up button, um, however crass it might look, it does work. So if there's something on the page, whether you're whether it's web copy or not, um, try and think of a way that you can really highlight it. Um, OK, so headlines. Um, headlines is, I, I think, are one of the most difficult parts of writing copy, um, sort of mostly because they're the first thing that your audience will read. Um, and if they don't like your headline, if they don't read your headline or they're not grabbed by it, they won't read on. So it's a kind of um, gate uh, to your copy. So getting your headline right is really important. Um, these kind of examples are just sort of, it's easy to write a headline which taken out of context um, seems to say something else. So arranging death of a loved one isn't easy, but there are companies and services here to help you every step of the way. Obviously somebody hasn't read that one back uh, to see what, what the other meaning might be. Um, but on a kind of more basic level, um, you know, this, this Jeep example, control your environment and connect at your convenience with available Uconnect systems. Um, you would expect to be able to control your environment in a car. You would expect probably in a new car to be able to connect um, your device or your um, you know, music and things like that. So what is this headline trying to say? Why should I be interested? Um, it doesn't grab me. Um, and I, I don't want to read on. So on, a, you know, on the most basic level, um, you need to be giving your audience something that um, answers a question or interests them. Um, so um, I've actually done a five minute video for Cardiff CPD, which um, you can find on their website and their social media. Um, but just kind of very briefly, um, some kind of tips that I tend to use when I'm writing headlines. I tend to use eight words or less, um, not always, sometimes it can look nice on the page if it's a longer headline, but it's a good rule of thumb. Um, in my video I go through lots of different kinds of headline, um, so I tend to find that I write the same kind of headline over and over again, um, and it can be really helpful to just kind of Put that headline into you know 10 different you know variations um, and see maybe which one is the strongest and it and it may surprise you and it may you know kind of get you out of a little bit of a of a, of a writing funk um, remember your audience as i've said your headline needs to grab your target audience and make them read on um, you know maybe it needs to have something in it for them um, it doesn't need to be a kind of you know tacky sales headline, but um, why, why should they be interested? Write it last. I tend to write um, headlines at the end because the body copy will often inform um, what my headline is going to be. Um, and I also find them quite difficult to write, so it can stop you from getting too much writer's block. Um, and I also spend a while um, workshopping a headline because it is that all important um, you know, that gate at the beginning of your copy so you know if you if you spend some time um, not just taking the, the first headline that you come up with and um, you may find that it's a lot stronger and more effective okay so our fourth top topic is um, about credibility um, and this is an interesting one because it can really make or break um, a company or an organization so this example here um, of LifeLock identity theft, um, I absolutely love. Um, the LifeLock CEO decided to post his social security number to prove just how effective the identity theft protection service that they were offering was. Um, and then he had his identity stolen 13 times by, by hackers. Um, and I think he's still struggling with 
with identity theft, you know, many years later. So if you're going to make a very bold claim, you need to be very careful and make sure that um, you are really sure that it's going to pay off. This anti-gambling ad in Vietnam unfortunately predicted who would win the 2014 Football World Cup. Um, much, much more difficult to uh, anticipate that one, but maybe they should have chosen a country that was less likely to, um, to win because, again, it kind of underme undermines the message. But on a less extreme note, um, you can lose a lot of credibility by just using too many adjectives and failing to mention specific services or facilities you're offering. So visit our fantastically relaxing spa for a wonderfully chilled out break with your favorite girlfriends. Um, that doesn't say, you know, why it's good for groups. Why is the spa particularly um, relaxing? You know, what facilities does it have? Um, it's very vague and I think you lose a sort of uh, a level of professionalism um, by, by failing to mention um, what makes your spa, for example, different. Okay, so um, what can we do to make your copy kind of feel more credible? Um, as we discussed at the beginning, using because um, and a reason will add um, kind of weight and authority to what you're saying. Um, you can add facts and, facts and statistics. So, you know, you may find that you are working with an audience um, who doesn't normally uh, respond, you know, particularly well to facts and statistics, but a couple of um, kind of well-chosen facts may just elevate your credibility um, and, you know, and just kind of add that, that something different that might uh, make your customer or your, your audience choose you uh, above somebody else. Um, you can include methodologies, you know, so you can kind of give that peer-to-peer -peer kind of peek behind the curtain, you know, maybe explain how you develop a product or maybe explain um, how you um, choose, you know, the best possible students. You, it's, um, it can be kind of really helpful to add that, those kind of details. Um, testimonials equally, um, you know, case studies showing that real people have, have succeeded with your service. Um, apologies and confessions is an interesting one. So, you know, if you if you have you know done something wrong and you've been found out, or if you sort of feel as a company that you could be doing better, say you have noticed that you don't have a particularly diverse workforce, um, there's a lot of credibility that you can gain by saying, um, you know, we would like to increase the diversity of our work workforce. Um, and we are going to do it in these ways by these specific deadlines. Um, and that's the bit that really counts is, you know, if you're going to make a promise to change something, then you want to make sure that you're backing it up um, and then obviously following through. Um, but though all of those things can really make you, give you a much better reputation um, as, as an organization. Okay, so topic five, um, is about tone of voice, uh, which is a difficult one because depending on what your audience is, you know, what they, who, wh how they respond to different tones of voice, um, you may have, you know, a wildly different tone of voice for an engineering company as for a fast food restaurant, for example, um, and they're right for your audience. That said, I think there are some sort of tones of voice that kind of rub people up the wrong way no matter who they are um, and you know I think kind of examples of being very pretentious um, your you know irritating tone of voice again it's all subjective isn't it but um, you know or bad use of humor humor that that you know maybe excludes your um, your target audience or is you know critical in a way that maybe isn't helpful I think all of those kinds of things um, could be too easy to do if you haven't thought very carefully about your tone of voice. So um, discovering your 
tone of voice um, can be kind of can be a process that you go through as part of a branding exercise. Um, you know, if you're a larger organization or company, um, but for smaller organizations, it's often kind of comes down to you to decide um, how you're going to talk to people. Um, so there's a kind of, there's a few things that you can do if you kind of exercises. Um, so it's helpful to think of your brand as an actual person. Um, what would they look and sound like? Are they young, are they old, are they serious, are they funny? Um, you know, you could even do a little sketch and stick them up on the wall where you write so that you kind of have a sense of who you are supposed to be writing as. Another way um, to kind of approach this is to get members of your team um, or even, you know, customers, people who've engaged with your company or organization um, and ask them to come up with adjectives to describe your brand. Um, and you can compare these adjectives to see if there are any common themes. It might not be exactly the same word, but it might be that a vibe kind of comes through. Um, and again, you can use those as jumping off points for your voice. Um, as with the research, if you go where your audience is, um, online forums are really good for this. Um, you can see how your target audiences spend time. You can examine how they talk to each other. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of you know, what they say to each other and maybe um, a way that you might be able to connect them. One thing that I would say about that is that if you're trying to use other people's tone, other people's kind of words in your tone of voice, you have to get it right um, because you can get something slightly off and it can kind of come across as quite cringy. Um, so, you know, all of that research can kind of just help you to um, kind of percolate into your tone of voice. Um, another way of doing it is, is picking a celebrity spokesperson. So um, if you've chosen an esteemed actor, you might want to sound distinguished. Um, if you've chosen a comedian, you might want to be your customer's kind of funny friend. Um, it, it, it really helps to kind of understand where you feel your brand is. And reading aloud is something that I recommend for all copy, um, but it's particularly good when you're thinking about tone of voice and brand. Um, if something feels slightly off, that's probably because it's not quite working um, and you need to go back and, and kind of try again. Um, and another kind of aspect of tone of voice is whether you use the active or the passive voice. Um, so an example of the active voice would be, um, we have helped over 5,000 customers. An example of the passive voice is over 5,000 customers have been helped by our services. So um, as a kind of general rule of thumb, the active, is, active voice is kind of snappier. It sounds more dynamic. Um, it's often simpler to read um, and more informal. And then the passive voice is usually longer. It sounds sort of weak or acted upon rather than the one doing the acting. It's often harder to read um, and it tends to be more formal. It's not always possible or appropriate to use the active voice, but if you are feeling that your copy is quite sluggish and a bit boring, it may be worth looking through and seeing how many examples you've got of the passive bit voice versus the active voice um, and just trying to turn a few of those around um, and see if that makes it feel more peppy. Okay so um, we've done our writing um, and you know you've you've gone your you've, maybe you've got your first copy your first draft of your copy or maybe you've even gone further down the road but um, it's really important not to skip editing. So I love this one. I mean, what are they talking about? Uh, it's never too late to start over. If you weren't happy with yesterday, try something different today. Don't stay stuck, do better. I agree, I disagree. Um, it doesn't really make any sense. I think that if anybody had attempted to edit this, um, they would have realized that actually that doesn't mean anything. 
Um, so editing is kind of your sense check moment. Um, does it work? Does it say what um, you want it to say? Is it exciting? Um, so, you know, in this example from House Hunters, we've got um, a call for something for a house which is very unique with lots of character. Okay, um, why doesn't everybody want something that's very unique or quite unique? Isn't unique already? enough why is the very there and um, there are things that you know you can take copy like that um, and with a good editing it can become so much better um, so it's important not to to kind of skip this step so um, a few examples then of kind of common mistakes that we all make um, you know I would say that we all waffle we all kind of tone down our copy with prepositional phrases so a kind of waffly um example uh, enough an example of waffly copy might be due to our expertise as a criminal defense firm um, which then becomes our criminal defense expertise means or even our criminal defense experts do this um, so you see how it kind of changes it it's again it's using the active voice um, rather than the passive voice, it's it's um, just kind of taking what you've already got um, and just kind of honing it to make it more interesting. Prepositional phrases, as I've said, um, are kind of one of those things that, that come up all the time. I'm writing in reference to the forthcoming meeting. I'm writing about the forthcoming meeting. Um, or even better, I'm writing about the meeting tomorrow at 12 to remind people that this meeting is happening. Um, I think it's it's a way that people um, often use prepositional phrases as a way of making their copy more formal um, because they think that more formal means more professional. But in reality, um, it often just means that it's more confusing or potentially more boring as well. Um, singular prepositions such as of, to and in Again, um, very easy to kind of liberally sprinkle these in um, and then a good editing. You can you can take them out. You can, um, you know, chop and change your sentences. Our aim is to support you. We aim to support you. Um, it feels a lot more personal. It feels a lot more direct. Um, sentence openers as well. Um, I think it's easy to fall into patterns of always starting sentences with certain words. Um, there is more information explaining what we do on our website. Visit our website for more information about our services. So you see how that's kind of more dynamic um, and it tells people what to do. Um, there is more information explaining what we do on our website. Doesn't tell people to go to your website. It just says that it's there. Um, Words ending in L-Y, so um, we examine accounts closely, becomes we scrutinize accounts, um, which is just so much more kind of specific and dynamic. Doing away with redundant words, um, we collaborated together, becomes we collaborated. Um, I commuted back and forth. I just, it's just I commuted, because these words already mean um, what we're trying to say um, but I think there is a tendency to add words where they're not required. Okay so um, our final topic uh, for this webinar is about proofreading. Um, again just as crucial as editing um, I tend to spend as much time um, sort of editing and proofreading as I might spend writing a lot of the time um, just because it's so important to make sure that your final copy is absolutely exactly the way you want it to be. Um, and those little errors can just really let you down. So um, the other thing about proofreading is that if you're writing anything which is online, particularly on social media, some smart aleck will come and correct your copy for you. So um, you know, this example from Dr. Pepper, they've used the wrong two 
um, and you know the uh, the second comment on that post is correcting that use of two. So um, if nobody noticed, I suppose it wouldn't be an issue. But people will notice. People will correct you, um, and it does make your your company or your organisation just seem that a little bit less professional. So. Um, this other example is um, another fantastically bad headline um, and this in this example it's all about context so it says wearable technology beacon augmented reality and content okay what does that mean uh, and then your first line of the copy says wearable technology was one of the big topics as at x s x s w 2014 i don't know what that is but um, maybe the people reading this might know what this is. Um, but the context isn't in the headline, therefore it doesn't make any sense. So how do we proofread? Um, I like to, um, to leave it for as long as I can. Um, sometimes, you know, you've got time pressures and all you can do is you can go and have a cup of tea, um, you know, leave it for half an hour or, or an hour and then come back to it. But ideally, um, if you can leave your copy for a day or so, um, you can get some distance from the text um, and hopefully it won't feel quite as familiar when you come back to it. Um, you can also change how it looks. So that might be printing it out. Some people like to read um, on screen. Personally, I like to print things out where possible. But if you are editing a you know, 80 page report, it's not very practical to, um, to print it out. So you can change how it looks on your screen. So um, a lot of the time we skip over errors because the lines of copy look the same. Um, so we don't notice maybe some of the, the mistakes that we've made. So if you can increase your font size and um, change your view, uh, put it in a different font, um, highlighting, whatever works for you, but changing how it looks can actually make it feel like a completely different document. Um, finding a quiet place to work is also really important. Um, I think it's tempting to, because proofreading is the last thing, you're often very bored with what you've been working on and you, all you want to do is get it out of the door. Um, so you try and do it with the TV on in the background or you try and do it on your way to work um, and it doesn't really work. You need you need somewhere quiet, ideally somewhere on your own um, so that you can really focus on it. And I would also say that probably the best thing you can do if you have time is to give it to somebody else. That might be a colleague or, you know, it might be a, an unfortunate partner or friend who has to read your copy for you. Um, but often they will pick up on things which you would never have noticed, um, something which doesn't make sense or hasn't been fully explained. Um, so it's a great opportunity to just um, get a fresh pair of eyes and notice some things that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, picked up on. Um, reading it aloud, again, um, if you take anything away from this webinar, um, reading copy aloud is probably my biggest my biggest tip because it just makes things um, makes all of those errors much more difficult to ignore and it makes um, you know all of those tone of voice and those content issues just kind of become glaringly clear um, as soon as you try and read it aloud. It's also sometimes helpful to do your proofreading and your editing in short blocks of time. Um, you know there have been lots of studies about how how long people can concentrate for. Um, I think it's about 25 minutes. So, um, you know, bearing in mind that you cannot concentrate for hours and hours without a break, try to structure your day so that you're actually um, breaking things up, you know, go for a walk, um, have lunch, cup of tea, sit outside, something that will um, kind of clear your mind so that when you go back, you're actually able to concentrate um, on what you're doing. And that's particularly useful for proofreading because you're so used to the document by that point that you will struggle to uh, concentrate on those errors. Okay, so that's the end of our topics for today. Um, 
So I'm hoping that we can have a little Q&A and discussion. Um, we've got 15 minutes remaining, which should be plenty of time um, to go through any, any questions that you may have. Um, and indeed, uh, have a discussion about you know, anything to do with copywriting. Um, so maybe... Sorry, sorry. Would, you, would you like yes. me to read these to you? Yes, please. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got two so far. Um, if anyone else wants to add that um, their question, just pop it into the Q and A box, and we'll, we'll get to it in a sec. Um, the first one you have kind of answered, but maybe you'd like to just expand a little bit. Um, so, pr for proofreading, is it better to ask a third party to proofread our work? So, I would say um, that the, probably the best person to read your work would be somebody um, who knows your, um, your company or your organisation. So I would say that the colleague is probably the, the perfect person um, because they will know, um, you know maybe what your target audience is interested in. Um, so they will be able to say, you know, maybe we need to um, emphasise this point or maybe we don't need this bit. Um, but if you don't have a, a colleague or you know say your colleague doesn't have doesn't have time then third party is is always really really helpful to get a fresh pair of eyes um yeah i i think that that um i always give i always give my copy to to everybody who will who will read it um because they they do pick up on things that you wouldn't otherwise so yeah Sorry, I was muted there. <laughs> okay. uh, thoughts on readability with underlining capitals and italics. Um, I've always been told only to use bold to highlight text as people read words by following the shape of the word rather than the individual letters. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, as I said in that section, you, you, I would definitely use it sparingly. Um, Bolding is the best use um, of emphasising text in a kind of layout way, um, but sometimes italicising, you know, a single word here and there um, isn't going to affect the readability, but it might kind of add to that eye appeal, you know, that kind of when you look at that big block of text, which ideally isn't a big block of text, but when you look at a page of text, um, what is jumping out to you and why? And sometimes just using bold isn't quite enough. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that um, people do tend to use, people do use the, the shape of the word to read. Um, and you, you do have to be careful about not putting everything into your, uh, into your copy to try and make it stand out. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple more. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, so I think maybe if we answer the, the ones that are here um, and then any others, I, I don't know if you'd be happy for us to send on any questions that, that come in later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So we, we have got quite a few that are coming through now that I just, I'm not sure we're going to get time to finish. So sure. I'll, just, I'll pick the most relevant ones now. Um, so we've got one question here, which is, how can I get faster at completing copy? I seem to agonise over each word. Okay, so um, what I, you know how I said that I spend as much time researching as um, I do writing. I actually try to write all of my copy in one go, if possible. Um, and I try not to edit as I go, which is difficult. Um, but what it does do is it allows you to get into a flow, which otherwise um, I'm very self-critical and I find that I will just stop at the end of every sentence and go back and edit and then I've lost my train of thought. So I have found that um, that not editing as I go is actually speeds me up in terms of, you know, um, it doesn't take as long to write. But it also um, kind of allows me to get the, get to the end of my thought without kind of criticizing myself too soon. Um, so I would definitely say that that helps. I also think that research can help if you are struggling with inspiration or motivation, um, because you know if you're writing, I don't know, you know, 
about us copy for a, for a website. Um, if you've looked at 10 of your competitors' websites and you've looked at their about us copy, um, you can you can kind of get a sense of what you do want to do and what you don't want to do, and that can speed up your writing process significantly. So I would say research and I would say writing without editing, if possible. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think this is going to have to be the last one, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So it's a two-parter. Um, any tips for helping to proof words that are written by senior people in organisations who maybe, well, it says here, by their own admission are terrible writers? I often find that when you proofread for them and amend, they basically just want what they've written, which is filled with jargon and not audience appropriate. The second part was... Um, any tips for writing when your target doesn't speak English or Welsh as a first language? Okay, yeah, those are really good questions. Um, yes, the senior people who don't, who know that they're not good writers, don't want to anything to do. Something I'm definitely coming across a lot. Um, I would say that um, I've had success in the past with using um, some kind of you know, gentle reminders of how people read. So, you know, using those kind of facts and statistics about people's reading age, um, any, if you've got any audience insight. So, you know, if you're writing a report and you know that the people who are going to be reading that report, um, say, don't have English as a first language or maybe haven't had secondary or university education, um, just to remind you know, if you if you're making amends to somebody else's copy um, to remind them of who they're speaking to and what words those people might actually be using themselves or understand themselves can be a good kind of prompt to um, be a little bit more respectful or, you know, um, what's the word, uh, you know, kind of choosing appropriate um, words. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's kind of, it is a tricky one, but um, I also find that having a face-to-face -face conversation helps with that. Again, very difficult when you are dealing with people high up, they often don't have much time. Um, your second question is about where people don't have English or Welsh as a first language. Um, yes, uh, I would say that, you know, breaking up copy into shorter sentences helps. Um, you know, layout also helps a lot with readability. So breaking those sentences in, you know, paragraphs into smaller sentences um, and also looking at, um, you know, copy, which does it very well. So I find the NHS website is really good. Um, obviously, it doesn't, doesn't, often doesn't have anything to do with what I'm writing about, but it's really good at explaining things in very simple language, which isn't dumbed down. Um, so that can be, it can be useful to have, um, you know, an organisation or a company that does it well. So you can just kind of read what they write um, and get a sense for how to make things clearer. Um, there's also, there are, um, you know, uh, sites online where you can look at words um, which are most likely to be confused by people who don't have English as a first language, which I've also found useful, um, you know, potentially words that we might think are easy to understand but often get confused for other words uh, in English by second uh, language speakers. So um, yeah that may be a, a good place to start. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rowan. Um, I have made a note of all the questions we haven't had time to answer, so we'll make sure that we get back to those people um, later on today. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody for um, attending and to Rowan for your time. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thank everybody. you. Bye. Bye.